if you just focus on the financial, you're going to have problems in other areas of your life. And so that's when I started to expand it out. And I started to look at, well, if a business has financial resources, but then it also has social resources, marketing, branding, and sales, what's the counter to that? And I was like, well, that's our communities and our relationships. And then also, if you know, what does a business has? It has all of our abilities, our health. You know, even if you have a bunch of employees, if they're all sick, it doesn't help anyone. So I kind of started to notice the resource similarities. And that was kind of the beginning. And then I built into the business model. Welcome to the Rich Fit and Happy podcast. I'm Crystal O'Connor, where we want to take you from drab to fab in this beautiful life. Let's go. Hello, hello. Welcome to Rich Fit and Happy podcast. I think this is episode 50, if I'm correct. So I would like to welcome a guest that I have. I brought him on because he talks about the family dynamic and compares it to finances and has a really good book. And I'll let him share a little bit more of that in a minute. But his name is Aaron Shelley. He has a master's in business administration, right, Aaron? And you've worked with small businesses. And then you have a a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, which is so interesting. You sound like a brainiac. But you, as you were working with these small businesses and have all this great experience, you started noticing the similarities between business and the family dynamic. So you wrote a book. What is the name of your book? The name of the book is called The Family Flywheel. Okay. And why did you call it that? Let's just get right into it. I called it that because there's a book called Good to Great. And in the business world where it talks about these flywheels, where if you get things going, then a lot of times they reinforce themselves and get stronger and stronger, right? I mean, this principle in finance is compound interest, right? You get more and it just keeps building on itself. So that's really the principle in family is if you get a good family structure going, it'll build on itself and you'll have tons of resources, both relationships, finances, as well as, you know, personal health and those things. I see how I have a program called Rich, Fit and Happy. And what you're saying is exactly what I was seeing when I was working with small businesses as well. I didn't necessarily tie in the family part, but the family and the happy is a big part of it as well. But all absolutely all are connected, aren't they? So what was the first thing that you saw or close to the first thing. I'm sure you saw several things at once, but what did you start to see initially about the similarities between business and family? Initial, that's it's going back a bit. I think it was, I would love to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, his book, he has a game, Cash Flow. That yes. book was good because it helps you understand how money flows. And he actually talks about a flywheel in money. But after I had tried that and I had invested in the real estate bomb in 2007 and got hurt. And then I ended up with all this mental stress and all these problems in my family. And I was like, well, if I only focus on the financial, I'm going to, I mean, I was in a very bad place mentally, even though I was married and had four kids, I think at the time. And so I'm like, if you just focus on the financial, you're going to have problems in other areas of your life. And so that's when I started to expand it out. And I started to look at you know, well, if a business has financial resources, but then it also has social resources, you know, marketing, branding, and sales, what, what does a family have? What do we have? What's the counter to that? And I was like, well, that's our communities and our relationships. And then also, if you know, what does a business has? It has all of our abilities, our health, you know, even if you have a bunch of employees, if they're all sick, it doesn't help anyone. So I kind of started to notice the resource similarities and that was kind of the beginning. And then I built into the business model. Okay. What do you mean the resources? Well, like if you look at a business, you have financial resources, how much money you have in the bank, you have the social resources, which is your brand and your marketing and sales. And then you have your human resources, which are your abilities, collective, you know, everyone in the business, your health and your time. And those are really the three big categories of resources you have in a business. And you use those, you know, if you're going to go and say, well, I need more marketing, I'm going to take some of my money. And I'm going to go hire a marketing person. And then maybe I'll take some, then I'll give them some money and then I'll work on paid ads. And hopefully that that drives more purchasing of my product, which then gives me financial resources, right? So it's, if you look at these things, it's all a system of investments. And if you're making good investments, then the business continues to get stronger and stronger. You know, you see Google at one point was worth a million dollars in 1999, I think. And at the time, Yahoo, which was its competitor was worth 92 billion. And so you look at this, like the resources were way out of whack, but the business model of what to do with those resources really determined the ultimate success where Google's now worth one and a half trillion and Yahoo got sold for a few billion to Comcast. Okay. Wow. Okay. So when you mentioned Robert Kiyosaki and his little game, is that something that you play with your family? Oh yeah. I played that. I actually love it because I had never understood investing. I understood savings because my mom was from a farming background. 
My dad understood investing, I think, a little better, but still a lot of savings. And so that was the first time I was like, oh, I don't want to be rich. I want to be financially free, right? And there's a difference. It's like you can always be more rich, and there's always going to be someone richer. But once you hit financial freedom, you've just hit it. And so I think there's some goal differences that people need to be aware of on the financial front. And so I played the game with my wife, and that gave us a common language with which we could talk about are we doing an investment? Is this an expense? Is this a doodad? Is, you know, what are we doing? Yes. How are we trying to play this game? So giving us the common language from Rich Dad, Poor Dad was super important to me, but I felt like it left out these other pieces. And that's kind of where I want the book to be is helping people fill in those pieces. I love that you said common language because I believe connection is currency, but also being on the same page, basically, and staying on that page and being consistent with those little systems. I mean, that's what a system is. It's consistency and doing something that is actually working over and over. And so um, I played that game too with my kids. In fact, I was selling commercial real estate in 08 and I had to make some real big changes. Like I knew, I talk about this all the time. I'm sick of hearing myself say it, but I was at a bloggers group and I didn't know what a blog was, but halfway through it, I got brave enough to say, what is a blog? And I remember the Des Moines Register, the city that I was in, took this picture, put me in the paper as the bloggers of Des Moines, but I just learned, it's just like, so all the guys, you know, the commercial real estate at realtors were like teasing me about having a blog and, you know, what is a blog and rolling their eyes. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do something with this because I want to start connecting with investors. To make a long story short, I went to a Robert Kiyosaki weekend thing and I like never looked back because I saw all that was going on online. I had come from TV advertising and saw what was being sold for, you know, just a 30 second ad, thousands of dollars, and now I could do it for free. So it was just, it was beautiful. It was just like all happening at once. But that weekend that I was there, bought that game and my kids loved it so much. It was a lot more fun than Monopoly. Isn't it more fun? Yes, it's more- It's my favorite game. I played it so many times. It's so funny because even my kids at age like seven and eight could do it because it's simple math, but then mm -hmm. it's fun as an adult. And I love Robert's notion of it or whatever it is that he said about the game, how this whole rep doing it repetitively is what's so needed because we weren't taught this in school. And so I love his little pyramid of education. And I kind of didn't mean to take off on that. I went off on a tangent with the whole board game. But did do you use that in your book? And do you talk about it? Or did you come up with your own little system? I don't get into the specifics. I'm trying to put together a lot of this, the whole pieces, you know, the system so people have a language. I do talk about Robert Kiyosaki in the book and say, <laughs> I think his stuff is a very aggressive style of investing. And I think Dave Ramsey's is more the conservative style of investing. I kind of mix the two a little bit because you know if you're investing really hard or not spending that much then i don't know how good the budget stuff really it doesn't really matter that much if you're not spending a ton like my wife and i we weren't really spenders my wife and i have i mean i would say we built an irish dance business and as part of that was because of robert kiyosaki said in the thing like you want to own assets and mm -hmm. so when i finished my mba program normally you go to a big company get a big signing bonus you know and keep kind of chasing those rolls along. But my wife had, and I had built this little Irish dance business. I think we had 30 or 40 dancers at the time. And I was like, well, we could build up this Irish dance business and have an asset or I could just chase the normal rat race. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the decisions that pushed us there as we understood, well, this is an asset. Here's how we want to do it. Here's how we want to build it. And it was rough in terms of building the business when I had kids and a house and everything, but we put the studio behind the house for my wife so she could teach and still be close to the kids. And so that was really formative in getting that stable income. I mean, it wasn't super stable in some points, but it was my wife and I, when we go through different things, like, oh, we'd start, I had worked at a startup and then that failed. And we're like, well, it doesn't matter because we have these assets underneath us. So that's the stuff where it's so important to get some of those assets. And I, like I say, the Kiyosaki super aggressive in his, like, just keep making the risks. They make sense. But Dave Ramsey, I think he has more of a peace of mind where it's like, yeah, but what is your mental state? Like after the 2008 market collapse, where I took on an extra, I, I doubled my debt almost because of the real estate purchase I had been forced to make. And so I had a, I took a quarter million dollar loss in 2008 and I was just getting started. And so my wife and I were like, we hate this debt. I'm like, I want to take risks in my other, in my business life. Let's get out of debt. 
So over the next six years, we just paid off our debt. But so from a financial perspective, every investor will say, horrible, horrible decision. You're paying 3% on your loan, put the money in the stock market, but you're not taking into account the mental load and the security that that brings, it brought for me. And that's where I think, you know, if you just focus on financial, you're not looking at the emotional side. And if you look at everyone, it's always the emotions that kill you in investing. It's not the rational decision-making, right? Right. My daughter, my youngest, she's 21 and she's learning from someone online about day trading. I have this big whiteboard. I'm in Florida and she's in Des Moines, but she had come to visit. And so it was like fun for me. If I get involved, then she pulls back. So I can't do that. But she was, she had on the whiteboard, you know, these instructions about emotions. This guy was teaching her about no emotions. And I was like, oh, this is so interesting. I need this. I've always thought day trading though, you know, was very risky, I guess. So what you just said about your perspective is kind of in the middle of there's Robert Kiyosaki where he's on the high end of risk. And then what's his name? Ramsey. Ramsey is really slow. I'm kind of in the middle. So I'm like you. So could you give us an example? I mean, you kind of did with the Irish school, the dancing school. That's really cool. By the way, why Irish dancing? My wife, she did it when she was really young. And then the river dance craze hit in the 90s. And she taught at the university and she danced with them. And then people were like, we want this. And so they kind of just, there was such a pull. And then she started teaching and then it just kind of naturally happened. So it worked out pretty well. And you're still doing it and it's growing. I mean, COVID hit hard, but... I mean, we went down, we had a lot, I had built an app. I mean, I had this other, I'm a tech guy. So I built an app to support people. And then my wife, when COVID, she's like, yeah. So we kind of had this thing to deal with that. But yeah, we're about, I think we're back up or above what we were at COVID. So, I mean, it grows. I don't know, we have a ton of space and it's it's kind of this cash flow business. You know, you can't grow it massively the same way you can some other businesses. That's why I take other risks now that that yeah. cash flow is secured. And so you go and you do some speaking on this system that you've created in the book that you wrote. I remember, sorry, an example. If we look at when I'm making a decision on that risk, it's like, well, what do we want to do with our family? For instance, like my wife really wanted to go to Austria because her dad's from Austria. She really wanted to go there. And I said, well, that's a lot of money. And also she wanted to go for a month. And I'm like, normal jobs don't give you these sabbaticals of a month. So then I'm making decisions of, jobs and consulting so that I have the flexibility. So when that comes, I can do it. And then after that was over, then I went back into the workforce. I was like, now I'm going to get back into a, you know, a nine to five or a startup type thing where I have to be more engaged. So that's kind of the decisions where I see there's broader stuff to look at rather than just the money. Because in that case, I was spending money, but I was investing in the relationships and the family. And I was investing in my extended family. So those are kind of the relationships that I think you should be accounting for not just the financial. And I would say another example of social connections and social resources. If we look at a company like Nike, right? How much is the brand worth? No one really knows, right? If you look on the balance sheet, there's a number that they'll put in to make the numbers work out, but it's just a guess because mm-hmm. no one can really, because that's a social resource that doesn't have a number. Well, we all have social resources in our own lives, right? People we live by, friends that we've developed, especially neighbors and those type of things, maybe members of your community, maybe members of a church or a sports group or those type of things. If we look at it and say, just from a financial perspective, oh, I have this job opportunity, I have to move, but they're going to pay me 20, 30, $50,000 more. Okay, you're going to get more pay, but you're going to ruin some of your social connections, right? Some of those people you have access to, you're going to hurt your brand because you've probably developed a brand, like especially in real estate, right? You develop a brand and all these connections And if you decide to move, even though technically you're making more money, you lost some of your brand and some of that social connection. So that's one of these things where as you're going about it and going, do I want to make this financial decision that's going to increase my finances, but it's going to cost me in social, you know, maybe not the best decision. And that's kind of where you see, you know, with advertisers, you do bad advertising, you can hurt your brand a lot. We're seeing that with Bud Light, right? Whether you agree or disagree, right? That was a decision that was very contra to their brand identity and ended up costing them a lot. And it wasn't well, an expensive. I'm so baffled. I, I really want to talk to, wouldn't you like to have been on the board or whoever made that decision to see what the hell they were thinking? What were they well, thinking? I, don't think, I think it was a very, if you really look at it from what I understand, it was probably like, oh, let's reach out to influencers. Let's go to different groups of influencers. Oh, we'll make these custom things. It probably ended up costing them $100 for their, you know, to do that. 
And then you look at the cost, you're like, oh, that was a hundred dollars that ended up costing billions of dollars. What? Like really poor mistake. So, so that's the type of stuff, the social connections, that's what it really damaged, right? It damaged the brand. Mm -hmm. And if you have a damaged brand, then all of a sudden your finances are going to hurt as well, mm -hmm. right? It's not just financial, it's social as well. So that's where I like these other resource types because businesses try to balance those and we should in our families as well. So if a family is really not, they really have not done a lot of investing themselves and they want to start doing it, where would you suggest that they start? I think the first investing is to invest in yourself. That's the human resource, right? Yeah. You should get a, go talk to some, read books, get a foundation for what you're trying to do. Are you going to try to go into real estate, day trading, stocks, you know, international stocks? Are you going to try to build a business? There's so many different ways to invest. You know, are you going to go flip houses? My brother-in-law has done that really successfully. Are you going to try to, there's so many questions. And so it's like, it's not easy money, right? And there's a lot at risk. So it's really go talk to people, go leverage what your social connections. If you have an uncle, a dad, you know, your daughter's coming and talking to you. All those things start to leverage your social connections for that education. Because if you're like, oh, I'm just going to go throw money into crypto. Good luck. You know, you might as well just go gamble. It may go up, it may go down, but it's yes. just gambling at that point. Yeah. It could be devastating. It could be devastating. So you don't believe in putting all of your eggs in one basket, right? So Robert Kiyosaki talks about passive income, active income, recurring. I think that's him that talked. Yeah, I, I, well, okay. I remember you know mostly what? passive from him. Okay. So it was passive. Sorry. That's actually one of the programs I taught, but I got the passive income from him. So the game, for those of you that don't know what we've been talking about, the game is to increase your passive income to pay for all of your bills, basically. So get yourself in a position where passive income is actually paying for your bills and then active income or anything that you make, you know, um, is just icing, right? What are some of the investments that you talk about in your book? Well, it depends. I kind of look at investing broadly. So there's financial investing where you're trying to buy a house or you're trying to buy a, something in there. But then there's also social investing. Are you taking the time to go meet? You know, like if you're a real estate agent and you're new to an area, the first yeah. thing they're going to say is go build your network out. And that so is investing. Earlier, like connection is currency. So that's one of the biggest, most important things I hear you saying. You've said it more than once now. So it's a big part of it. So what about introverts. This comes to my mind. I have introverts in my family, a couple of them actually, and I'm not an introvert, but I sometimes worry about them because going out and meeting people isn't like easy for everybody. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's not easy for everyone to go out and do that, but I think most introverts still have groups. Like a lot of people are like, I'm an introvert, but I love to play sports. I'm an yeah. introvert, but I love to do this. So then it's just like, well, why don't you go talk to the people you're already friends with and just go ask them, hey, what are you guys doing? What are you investing in? Like starting to build those things out. Yeah. I mean, early on, at one point I was good at looking at insurance and that whole thing is like, go build out your network. And I'm like, yeah, that's not really the big thing where I'm going to go try to leverage all my friends to try to make sales. Yeah. And so I think it's a lot about who do you already know? You know, I think most people that I've ever met that are wealthy, I'm trying to think of any exceptions, especially if they have someone who's close to them. If that person comes to them and says, hey, I want to learn what do you think I should do? Most of the time they'll be like, here's how I did it. Here's what I did. Here's kind of my strategy. I don't believe it's right or wrong necessarily, but here's what I did. And they'll help you. A lot of the people in my family, if I had nephews or nieces who came to me and said, oh, I really want to invest in this, or I want to learn about this. I'd be like, cool, I'll help you learn about it. And I may even put money into it, right? I mean, has your experience been any different? Most wealthy people are very getting when it comes to people who want to learn. They tend to be really frustrated if you're like, hey, can you just give me money? Because that's the thing where I get into the resources and the business model. The business model is how you make money. The resources are just a byproduct of a business model, right? So if you look at it, most people will be like, like Robert Kiyosaki talks a lot about how he got rich in real estate. That was his business model, right? I'm going to go buy real estate, do that, keep the flywheel going. And now I'm going to go buy more and more of this real estate. So everyone, if you're focused on the business model, when you talk to wealthy people, like, just tell me what you did. I want to understand the path. Then I find they're super giving. If you come to people and say, and even they'll help you financially, potentially. But if you come to them and just say, hey, I just want your resources. Hey, can you hook me up with this relationship and this connection and give me money? Then they're like, eh, kind of no, I don't trust you. I don't want to burn my relationships because you just are going to be a taker. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I see with wealthy people, they don't tend to be like, 
dingy, like they're depicted in sometimes in the movies as these greedy people. They really want to invest in other people, but there's so few people who actually want to invest. There's a lot of people who just want to be given stuff. Yes. It reminds me of the 80-20 rule. It seems like about 80% of people are like that. Well, here's the thing, though. I What I tell people, and I don't know if you would agree, is to, yes, start investing in yourself. And sometimes they don't know what that means. It means just like learning, listening to podcasts learning what other people are doing, asking yourself, can I see myself doing that? And then I've always said the fastest path to cash is a service-based business because it's something that you don't have to create it. You have to invest in it necessarily. Well, some service-based businesses you do, but a lot of times you can just go offer the service, especially now. So it, even though things are more expensive and I'm just throwing this out there, you can agree or not, but for conversation purposes, but it, you know, even though things are crazy expensive right now, like it's insanity and we're all experiencing it across the board, like across the country. And I live in Naples, which is even more, but I really think across the board, it's about the same, but it's never been a better time. People can make money like the, the in the same day. My daughter has done Uber and DoorDash to make money like right away. And I'm seeing that what is happening with that is people are less likely to be employed because they're learning how to make money in all these different ways. And now the small business owner that needs employees is struggling. Have you seen that? Yeah. Hi. So anyway, I just threw that out there, but wow, it's just, it's crazy. You know, when I look at my parents, they're in their seventies and I think of what they paid for their house and then make little comments about the youth today. And I think the youth today, do you know what they have to pay for a house? I mean, it's not fair, is it? It's really kind of not fair. When I think about some situations where people bought a house for 9,000, they paid it off a long, long time ago. They don't have a house payment. And they, for instance, got a really great blue collar job that had a pension plan. Now that's paying off. And all of, I had someone tell me the other day that there are no such thing as the pension plan that my dad got at Caterpillar when he was an electrician. And things are just drastically different. And I don't think they really have any idea what it's like right now for our youth, middle age, and what we're having to pay for things now. And an income, salary rather, it doesn't meet, it's not meeting the cost of living. And so I'm not sure exactly why I said that, but I'm going to bring it back around to what you're saying is just so important. What you wrote, the book that you wrote and the information that you're sharing, sharing is so important right now for people to invest in themselves and start learning because you have to, to survive. You have to think like an investor to survive because there aren't the pension plans of yesterday. Houses weren't nine and $30,000 anymore. And so if you're not an investor, I don't know how you're going to do it. Have you ever thought about that? Like, how are people doing it if they're not investing? Well, I guess in the, in the context of my book, I think if you understand it, everyone is an investor. Every individual is spending their time doing something. Yeah. Every individual is spending their energy doing something, right? So everyone is investing or could invest. Maybe they're watching Netflix all day. If you're not yeah. watching Netflix a bunch, then yeah, you're spending your time in something that is just a loss for the business. And those right? same people, I think a lot of times are ordering DoorDash and they're paying $35 for a sandwich to be delivered to them. Well, yeah, and that, that's oh, part where I look like the costs have gone up. But I remember when I was working, I worked at Ancestry.com and I was I would buy my dollar, you know, whatever, $2 little lunch meals because I was like, this is what I'm trying to save for my family. Therefore, I'm being scrimping here. Yeah. This is the same in a business, right? You don't start a business and you're like, well, we're going to start all of our employees. We're going to have great meals. We're going to have all this great stuff. You're like, we're going to scrimp in the early days until we get the flywheel going. And then once you get the flywheel going and you're like, now we're making a lot more money, then you start to go, well, now we need to attract better talent. We want to attract this. We're going to extend our benefits. I mean, most small businesses, you don't even have insurance, right? You're scrimping. And that's where I think most kids, I mean, I lived over in Russia for two years. I've traveled to India. Uh, yeah, I've traveled to India, I've traveled to China, Philippines. So there's like this big contrast where you come living in Russia for two years, then coming back, this was in the late 90s. And then I came back and I was like, we live such a lavish lifestyle. Like people will complain, oh my gosh, everything's expensive. Yes, if you want to live the exact same lifestyle your parents did after 30 or 40 years 
of life and you're 20 and you're just starting and you're going to go try to do that. And so that's where I think there's this disconnect of, do you really appreciate what you have? If you're going to Starbucks and you're getting your $4 lattes and then you're getting your DoorDash because you don't want to leave the house and then you're spending your time either watching Netflix or playing video games, good luck. I mean, like the reality, I think, in, like I went to, when I was in the MBA program, I really was interested in marketing. And so I spent 70 hours over the course of just two weeks building this marketing thing in Excel. And it was, I didn't think I'd make anything. It was just something I wanted to learn about. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not in, that's why I mean, like investing in yourself and the learning, that's the thing in Robert Kiyosaki's game. It assumes every time you pick up a deal, it's assuming that you know the market, right? This stock is up. This stock is down. You don't get that in real life unless you're watching the market and understand it. You know, this house is a good deal or it's not a good deal. If you're not, if you don't know the real estate market, you don't get that information. So the game assumes that you're investing in your information a ton. And yet most people that I see aren't really investing in their own information. They're just like, well, I want to have this nice, comfortable home. I mean, my house, I didn't have air conditioning in my house. I live in Utah. So we get into that high 90s, low 100s sometimes. We had a swamp cooler and I didn't really, it was hot. There were some days when it's like super hot and my parents have AC, but I'm like, man, it's going to cost us twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to get it all do all work through. Is it worth it right now? No. So we had air conditioning in the studio because it was making money because mm -hmm. we could teach classes in June, but we don't have air conditioning in our house because it's a liability. You know, it's a not liability. It's just an expense. Yeah. So it's those type of things. When you look at like, if you, we live so much more comfortably and I think it's the context a little bit where they're like, well, I can't, I don't know. I mean, I remember when I was young to play a video game, I had to buy a Nintendo and I had to buy every game. So we always had to work. But I see now where it's like, I have my phone, I can play infinite number of video games and I can just waste my time there. And you look at it going, we have Google, we have the internet, you have Zillow. If you want to go into real estate, you can go find infinite information. And yet most people are just taking their energy and throwing it away in my view. So that's where it's like, you need to learn to invest in yourself, in your own knowledge. And most of the successful people that I know aren't, they weren't like, well, I just worked nine to five. Even the people like, you know, who were working those pension jobs, it was like, oh, now they have, they're forcing us to do overtime or we have to do, or I'm doing overtime to get, make for my family a better life. So there wasn't this very simplistic, like we only worked 40 hours a week and somehow everything worked perfectly. I didn't see that as much. And I see that expectation more from my kids. I mean, I would go to work and then come home and then work, help my wife with things, go to Irish dance things, have the kids while she was doing stuff. I mean, I wasn't doing any type of normal nine to five. And that's, I think, what made me successful. Not to mention that I was reading tons of business books and constantly trying to reinvest in myself. But if you're not doing that investment in yourself, you're not doing your investment in your information, you're not investing in your social connections, whether that's a church or you know, a sports group, whatever, well, why do you expect to be wealthy in any of the metrics if you're not investing in them? I know one family that invested in real estate. They spent a lot of time fixing the real estate, getting it ready to sell. Oh, they moved out. Great. Now we have to go remodel this, repaint it, right? Oh, now we got to get that thing turned as fast as possible. That's the life. I do think Dave Ramsey's thing of live like no one else so you can live like no one else mm -hmm. is a good thing. If you live and scrimp and have the and take all the money and then invest it, in the long term, you'll do better. But if you want to live fat now, the odds are you're going to live pretty poor later. Yeah. Wow. You just said a lot, but it was all really good stuff. It was all really good stuff. So what do you, let's wrap this up. What's the one thing that you would tell a family besides to get your book and to start implementing some of this, get the flywheel going? What's the one thing that you would pull from the book to entice them to go buy it and start doing immediately? The one thing I would say, the business model, we didn't really touch on, but that's a lot around what's your culture, your strategy, and your structures. This is a lot of logistics in families, right? Just like in business, someone's got to do the jobs that suck. Building that out, figuring out what your purpose as a family is, just like as in a business, and then being able to align your culture and your structure with that, it makes it so a lot of the fights that you have and a lot of the disagreements go away because they're not about where are we going, they're about how we get there. Right. So if you're saying like, here's where we want our family to go and here's what we want to achieve as a family, then then it's much easier to say, well, should we spend this ten thousand dollars on a trip to you know Europe or should we spend this ten thousand dollars on an investment property or on stocks? Right. 
So it's really building out your business model. That's really the lifeblood of any business. And if you don't have a good business model, I can give you, I mean, I have a story in my book of a woman who was given $20 million at 18 by her dad. Well, her dad died actually. And that was the insurance policy payoff. You know, she's on policy. Well, that was, yeah, he had, you think his whole policy was 200 mil. So he was very well off, but she got $20 million. She's on her fifth marriage. I think now she's bought and sold and destroyed companies. She had to get money from her mom. Like that's the problem. Resources do not solve problems. There are no poor people. In my opinion, there's just people who have bad business models. Because if you took people like Elon bad, Musk. I like that. I like that. Right. I mean, if you have a business that's going out of, I mean, if you've done consulting, you go into a business and you're like, I don't care how much money you have. I care what you're doing with the money you have. And are you producing more money than you're spending? It's really looking at the business model. If you have a bad restaurant, you don't go in there and be like, oh, I'll just give you money and that'll solve the problem. You go like Dave Ramsey, when he goes into on Kitchen Nightmares, I think he goes in there and he's like, you're selling too much stuff. Your margins aren't good enough. You don't have good cooks. You know, he goes through and he rips apart their business model, fixes those things, and then they start making money. So that's the problem is you can't solve the business model problems with resources. And that's where I think people get caught up. And it's the same with families is you can't give a family a lot of money, you know, give someone $20 million. There's a, another lottery example I have in my book where the guy got $20 million and then he ended up dying of drug abuse, I think six years later, you know, so you, you end up in these scenarios like resources are not the problem, but everyone focuses there. So focus your attention on what is your business model? If you want to be, if real estate investing is going to be what you're, how you're going to make your money, learn it have your culture around yeah, that's, it. That's a lot of hard work, by the way. I did a little bit of that. And so it's almost like one of those things where it sounds really good and it sounds fun and, and it could be for somebody that likes it, but it's almost like you got to do it to see if you like it. I got scared because I got sued a couple of times. And so I realized that having an attorney on hand was very helpful, but I transitioned and it was like, whew, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, so it just, again, goes, goes back to the emotion. What can you handle? What kind of stress can you handle? And it's all various types of stress, okay? Because that's what life is and understanding how to manage it. But, you know, was I just jumped in too big and there were just too many big moving parts to that that scared me. And I think it's kind of, it's a man's game in my opinion. And, you know, there was one time I was like crawling underneath the, with a flashlight and there were these big spiders. I was like, what am I doing? I've lost my mind. I've lost my mind. But I thought that I could find investors and I would make an offer, for instance, and then go find the investor. And then, then there was that stress of hurry up, hurry up. I need to find an investor now. And then I couldn't find one. And then I've made an offer and then I was sued by the woman. So it was like, I can't handle this. Um, but it was a really good experience for me, even though it was stressful, it was a good experience. I had to do it to know that I didn't want to continue doing it. And I think that's an important part of the investing thing. I haven't done a ton of real estate investing either because I look like I'm more interested in the business side for yeah. me and I'll just I have different businesses. So I, I think it is, it's really important what you said, though, of just going and doing stuff. You don't want to spend all of your life savings. Like, I'm going to go open a restaurant. Do you understand the failure rate of those? Like, uh, maybe yeah. go work in a restaurant. Go talk to restaurant people. Like, invest your time first because you have some of that. Mm -hmm. And then get into it. You know, I've seen people who have food trucks. And then the food truck gets really popular. And then they build a restaurant. And you're like, oh, look at the expense profile difference. So there's a lot of ways to do it. And I think a lot of times younger people are like, well, I want to have a restaurant. You're like, but that's not how that person got there. You know, maybe they were a chef over at this one, chef here, then they studied culinary store, whatever their path was. And you're only seeing the final result of, oh, I have a successful restaurant. Mm -hmm. And you're not understanding, wait, they partnered with a business person to do that. I mean, that's what I see in my wife's and I relationship. I don't actually do Irish dance. I've never done it in my life. My wife's offered, but I'm like, I want to do the business stuff. And she takes care of the other side. And that's where I think it's so interesting in a business. It's very clear that you want to have complementary skill sets in a business, yeah. right? And yet in a marriage, it seems like a lot of times we're going for overlapping skill sets. Well, mm -hmm. I want to make the money and I want my husband to make the money too. Wait, who's going to take care of the kids? Who's doing the rest? And I've had a lot of successful women that I've talked with and consulted with, and they're going, well, I want to marry this really driven man who's like an executive and I want to be a really driven person. I'm an executive too. And I'm like, so if the kid gets sick, who takes the time off? Well, I didn't think about that. He will. 
well, I don't know very many driven men who want to. So maybe you're looking for a unicorn here. And they're like, oh, I didn't think about some of these things. So that's where I see like a lot of these this fundamental basic business principles. As soon as you bounce them back to the family life, you're like, this is a moronic. <laughs> like, like, why are we not spending more time when we're trying to get married, looking at overlapping business models or complementary business models, instead of just looking at a phone and being like, hot, hot, no, hot, not hot. You know, you're like, if you hired in your business that way, it would be a disaster. And yet we do that in all these marriages. And you're like, I wonder why we have a 50% success rate. Well, pretty obvious. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. So is dating part of your book? Yeah. Okay. Well, cause it's this part of just finding another founder. Right after I said that I did see a part, I didn't read the whole book. Okay. But I did see a part of it. Yes. And sorry. So I apologize for that. But yeah, that's, that's the thing where I think there's so many just simple business things. Like if you were dating, you're like, what are my goals and my long-term things that I want? And then if, especially I see a lot of young men, they're like, I don't know, I can't find any good, good women. And then I'm like, well, where do you want to do in your life? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, you think that's even remotely attractive? Like think about hiring someone into your business. And they're like, so what do you do? I don't know. You just try to make money. You'd be like, I don't want to work for that. Those stupid people. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And that's what I see a lot of people trying to do in the dating market right now. That's where I think the more, I just keep seeing over and over the, the parallels. One that I've seen a lot lately is just like, a lot of times people are under investing in their children. Like when I was young, I'd come home from school. I failed the test and my mom would be like, so why'd you fail the test? Well, I didn't study. Okay, we learn. Oh, I got kicked in the face today at school. Well, why did you get kicked in the face? Did you kick him first? Oh, maybe you should not do that. Like there was this constant, I would call it therapy every single day from my mom. And yet I see a lot of people when they're like, well, we're both going to work and no one's going to spend time with the kids. And then you're like, all the kids need therapy. Well, yeah, that was a job that the parent used to do. And now we're no longer doing it. And then you wonder why the kids are messed up. And then they're like, well, we have a lot of money, but our kids are messed up. And now we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to get our kids in programs to fix our kids which is really just a byproduct of the decisions we made. So that's the type of thing when I look at investments, it's like, are you investing correctly? And do you understand the ramifications? Because my thinking is most people do the best they can with the knowledge they have, but they don't have a good model for how the whole system works. And mm -hmm. so they keep you know, doctors who dedicate themselves to it and then their wives hate them, their kids hate them, they get divorced and you're like, was it worth it? Like, what the freak were you working for if not for your family? Yes. So looking at the end result and then reverse engineering. And this word reverse engineering online is like used all the time, but it is a good one. Let's just be honest. It's a good one. But you have to look at the end result. What do you want? And then know what you want going in instead of kind of like what you described, looking at a dating app and then, you know, flipping left and right and making no real sense other than what you see with your eyes. And it's just like with marketing, you can't go into a business and not have an actual strategy with your marketing and start throwing things on the wall and not test tracking and tweaking to see what's working so that you can keep doing what's working because that leads to the systems that actually start turning. Yeah, because it's the learning, right? I mean, this is another thing I love about Kieske is he's like, you need to learn. Like, don't work for money, work for knowledge. And that's the thing where if you get into that pattern, especially if you're in what I call technology, you know, we're constantly reinventing ourselves. That's super important. And that's where, so that's the kind of thing where I look at, if you're looking at the whole, and there's a fun example about looking at the holistic family of Bill Gates, right? Most people don't know about Bill Gates' mom, right? So Bill Gates' dad was a lawyer. His mom was a school teacher. She dropped out of teaching after she had three kids, spent her time with her kids. And then she decided that she was going to serve in the community. So she served on the board of the University of Washington. Then she served on the board of United Way. Well, it happened that she served on the board of United Way with the CEO of IBM, which happened to be a very important connection for Microsoft. So in this thing of you can look at it from an investing, some people would say, well, she's just serving. And I would put, no, she was investing in her social connections. And that social connection may have been worth 50 to $100 billion, which if she had just gone back to work, she could have made, I don't know, another $40,000, you know, whatever per year. And so that's the thing where it's like, holistically looking at the investments your family's making and making sure that they make sense, not just from a financial, but from a social, because I actually believe if you holistically look at it, you'll be financially wealthier, relationship wealthier, and human resource wealthier 
than if you just focus on the financial side. Yes, I agree. I saw something the other day posted, what you just said reminded me of it. And it was a list of what middle class and and the wealthy, how they think differently and connections are a big part of what the wealthy consider to be a priority, you know, their connections. And that's what I've heard you say several times that not enough people really take a look at, which reminds me of the one quote that changed my life. And that quote was, you want to see your future, name the five people you spend the most time with. And at the time, I didn't like the people that I had to spend time with at work. And it wasn't that I didn't like them as much as I didn't want what they were having. And so I really took a look at that. And it, it just was like, it got in my brain. It, and within a week or two, I started seeing things differently and seeing opportunities. And that's what led to the Robert Kiyosaki weekend. And that is what literally changed everything. So I, I invested $25,000 in this program with him. Let me just say this too. One thing that I probably, I didn't ask anyone else, so I shouldn't assume I'm the only one, but what I noticed more than anything I ran with was not just the real estate investing, but the woman that stood at the front for the weekend that taught and when she sold at the end of the weekend, I started running the numbers and thinking, oh my God, look how many they sold to. So that room was really full. I would say about 300 people and they sold, I don't know, maybe 50, I'm going to say 50, $25,000 packages. And I remember thinking, I want what she's having because I can talk and I can teach because I have an education background and I like it. So that's that changed everything for me right there. So selling one to many. Was like and one thing we talk about social connections, I would say that the thing about social connections is if you do not treat those social connections well, you will be screwed, right? If you invest in these social connections, but you're always the person who's like, hey, and pushing the sale over and over, like, hey, I, the only reason I want to talk to you is this, it yes. just doesn't work. And so a lot of, as I've seen it, if I've seen it in my own personal life, it's like, how can I contribute to these people? How can I help them? And then you're building up that connection, then there's reciprocity there. But if you yeah. just try to go build your connection and they're like, oh, there's the douche, there's the crappy guy over there who's always asking for relationships and always trying to get something out of me, then you're actually hurting your social resources. I, I don't get asked this enough, but I know that I have been asked in the beginning when I first started, I was asked a few different times this one question that stuck with me. And I thought that's what a sweet thing to ask. And the question was, is there anything I can do for you? What can I do for you? So I tell people for social connections, start asking people that, what can I do for you? And obviously you can't do for people all day long for nothing, but it does add up. So you know, when you're planting your seeds, it's going to harvest at some point. So yes. So asking people that, you know, there aren't very many people that ask that question these days. Have you noticed that? I haven't. People seem much more self-focused and they're not really investing in their extended community. And you look at it going, the more we all work together, mm -hmm. and I hadn't thought this, you know, I used to be much more focused on, I need to be excellent and that's how I'm going to win. And I still think I need to be excellent so that people want me on their team. Right. But I'm also need to go like, how can I extend this? This guy has those skills. This other one has these, we bring them together. Now we can do something great. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much of that where the more we cooperate and coordinate, there's more than enough money to go around. And there's more than enough if we're focused on contribution. Yeah. But if we get focused on how do I make money? How am I making money on this relationship? You know, mm -hmm. there's a guy who still owes me like 30 grand. I worked with him and I was like, I know who he is. I know what he's going to do. I know what he could do. I just have to accept that and I have to build, feel good about it. And I would rather be the person who gets screwed than the person who is screwing other people, right? Because I don't want my reputation hurt like that. And you see that with all over in social media, businesses do this all the time, right? Like, oh, you had a bad experience. We're going to overcompensate you to make sure that this one person doesn't go ballistic on social media. And the interesting thing is in a lot of cases where those people they overcompensate, then those people become their biggest fans. Yeah, I had this problem. And look how they took care of me. This was amazing customer service. And if you look at the ROI on that one relationship, you're like, dude, we lost $30 on this $50 sale. That was bad. But then you look at what it does for your brand broadly, and you're like, it was worth it all day long because that person is now a raving fan. Podcasting is an investment in time, but 
I feel like that it's very rewarding because of the face-to-face. -face. And I think there's just a longer connection that's made. And it, it's really hard as everyone can kind of see themselves playing on social media. It's really hard to make any kind of lasting impression or connection with anybody without being face-to-face -face and having conversation. And so anyway, I thought I would throw that in there. No, I completely agree. Podcasting, there's so many podcasts. Some of my favorites are like Freakonomics podcast. I'm like, they're giving me all this oh information God. for free, Yeah. right? It's like all of these podcasters are trying to help me. And if I listen to them, like I'm sure in your case, hey, I listen to what you're saying. And then I'm like, oh, do you have a book? Can you help me? And you're mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to give you something. I can't give you all, like your point. I can't give you all my time, but I can give you a piece of it. Or I can have these conversations that'll help you. Even if you never buy anything from me, I've still added value to that person's life, mm -hmm. right? But I think that's the whole, you're giving to the community first, and then you're trying to, you know, there's a place where you're saying, well, if I can make money off this, I will. And that's the great entrepreneurial side, in my opinion, right? Like you're trying to preach in other people and then hope to make money. So I think that's a great piece of podcasting. I think it's a great thing in a lot of them. Thank you so much for being part of this. And then for you listeners, go through to the show notes. And do you have a program, by the way? I know you have a book. We've mentioned it several times, but do you have an actual program or something they can buy? How program they can buy. I just have resources on my website, will.com, where you can go download. It'll go through all the resources. It'll go through your business model. If you're married, it's usually good to go through that together so you can compare and contrast. It'll work through a lot of the problems before they happen. So I have that. And then if people want to find me on social media, you can find me on LinkedIn or Facebook at Aaron K. Shelley. But yeah, I'm more interested in just how do I help people? I've had a lot of success in my life because of other people. And so I just am in the mode of how do I help them? Thank you so much, Aaron. And everybody look at the show notes. I'll have everything in there information-wise so you can connect with him. Thanks again and have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.